Okay, welcome everyone. Today we're going to be doing this very fun topic of what's called PEAS, Performance Environment Actuators and Sensors. It's a very introductory, very easygoing topic in the good old fashioned AI, the rational agent design class, okay? So let's get started. So essentially what we're trying to do in this lecture is something very simple. All we're trying to do is we're just trying to specify what is the agent and the rational agent and the task environment and how do they interact? So essentially, the way these two things interact is that the rational agent is trying to do something and the task environment is what it finds itself in. So what it's trying to do, we call that, we specify that as P for performance measures. What is the agent trying to achieve? E stands for environment, also called the task environment, which tries to specify how the environment behaves and we'll dig a little deeper into that. Actuators, is essentially what does the agent have to interact with and influence our environment. For example, if it's an if it's a chess playing program, then it might have a might have a move API. So it makes a move, and this is how it interacts with the environment. Or if it's a mechanical chess, maybe it actually picks up a move, picks up a piece and actually moves it. If it's a car playing, uh, if it's a car driving agent, then it might have at its disposal. A brake pedal, an indicator, um, a wiper, the display, the gas pedal, things like that. So all the ways in which the agent can interact with the environment, we refer to as actuators. Then it comes to sensors. That's the last S of the acronym, P's. And the S stands for sensors, which says, what can the agent use to sense and observe the environment? It could be a physical camera, it could be simply a database that it's reading and that whatever it's reading is called the, the sensor. Once we have all of these fours defined, then we say our agent and the task environment interaction is well-defined. Now the environment itself can take a few different attributes to define and let's dig into those. We normally call those as seven attributes Sometimes people call them eight attributes as well as you might see in different sources. Let's dig into them one by one, okay? So firstly, the first attribute of the environment type is observability. So that means that is the agent able to see the, the environment or partially see the environment or not see the environment at all? So for example, if it's a chess playing robot, then most likely it can see the environment. It can see where the moves are. If, for example, it's a car driving agent, then maybe the car driving agent cannot see the environment entirely. It can perhaps see what sits in the field of the vision of the camera, but it cannot see what's behind the other car. It may not be able to see uh, what's happening on the on the bridge over or what's on the after you take the left turn, what you're going to find there. It cannot necessarily see that, although it might have other sensors also to get information about that, such as traffic updates, et cetera. So when you look at sensors, you have to take all the different sensors in the entirety to define the uh, to define whether the environment is observable or not. But once you take a sum of all the sensors, based on what you can see, you call that environment, you use that to define the environment's observability. Next simple attribute is simply uh, in the environment, do you have one agent or multiple agents? If the agent is playing against, uh, is playing a single person game uh, where it has to move the marble pieces or move the knight until it can come to the first square, then it is a single agent environment. If it has multiple agents, uh, then perhaps, for example, when the car is, the, the, the agent is driving, but then there's other traffic on the road as well. So there are other agents, whether they are human or they're uh, robots, it doesn't really matter, but there are multiple agents there. And now those different agents could also be in a competitive environment. For example, they're playing a game with this agent, like a, a, a robot is playing the game against human, or it could be a bit more dramatic scenario when there is a, some sort of a, a war playing scenario there uh, that could also be competitive. An agent could have many different other agents, which are its allies and other agents, again, whether human or robotic, which are the adversaries. And so the, the environment can be, the competitive nature of the environment can be rather complicated. Or in some cases, in many cases that we look at, 
the environment may, may simply be collaborative. So for example, there are multiple agents. They're all trying to pick the boxes and put them on the conveyor belts. And they're all trying to collaborate with each other because after all, they're trying to get the work done. So the next different environment type attribute is called deterministic, is whether the environment is deterministic or it's stochastic. So stochastic means that there's an element of chance that even when you do the action, uh, what you might see may depend upon what is the uh, what comes up in the in the dice. For example, in the games of chance, if you make a roll of a dice and the dice comes up to be three, then perhaps north means going north. And if you come up with two, then perhaps it means that you'll have to change the direction and go in the other direction. So if the environment type is stochastic, that means there's an element of chance. And if the environment type is deterministic, that means that the, the effect is determined by the action. So far, just to summarize, take a midpoint here, we're trying to see the environment type and study the different attributes of the environment type here, okay? So let's keep going. So the next particular aspect of the environment type is whether the environment is atomic, that is episodic, or it's sequential. If the task that the agent is trying to do, each task can be considered one task by itself, then we call it episodic. As a good example is, we see an email, the agent has to mark that email as uh, as high priority or not as a high priority, something that has to be reviewed again or not reviewed again. In that case, because each email can be reviewed independently, we call that atomic. If in some cases you have to look at a multiple such emails to see what should be the next course of action, you might call that sequential. Just like in a, in a game such as chess as well, multiple moves make together one outcome, we call that environment to be sequential. So that's a simple difference between episodic and sequential. Let's look at the next environment attribute, which is static versus dynamic. And many of these names may sound similar to each other, but let's make sure we understand each one of them, each one of them separately. So here we're talking about static and dynamic. If we say that the environment does not move while the agent is responding, that means it's static. So it does not change. If the environment itself is moving while the agent read the environment one time, got the you use the sensors to understand what the environment state is. And then by the time it gets to move, the environment has already moved, such as in a traffic environment, then we say that the, that the dynamic, the environment is dynamic. It could also be that the environment doesn't quite change, but because the time is passing, the agent's reward is changing. We call that such, such an environment to be semi-dynamic. A good example of that might be a chess playing game where really the board doesn't quite change, but if you sit too much on a move, and for example, in a common chess uh, game, there are rules of time. So if you do not make your 40 moves in time, you, are, you already lose. So therefore, the agent's reward is going to change. So therefore, the environment is said to be semi-dynamic. Okay, let's keep going here. We have two more to go. The environment type is can be discrete versus continuous. This is relatively easy to understand. If you can make actions that are discreetly defined, such as go north, east, south, or west, there are four. Maybe there are more than four, north, northeast, east, but still there's relatively few countable and discreetly defined. We call that environment to be discrete. If you say that the and the, the agent, the environment can be, your action can be go 37.58 degrees north of east. And there is no such discrete interval where that's defined. Then the environment is said to be continuous. Most real world environments are continuous. Uh, the physical world environments, but most digital world environments are discrete. The reality somewhere sometimes sits in between that we might have an environment might have a continuous environment, but we may discretize it. For example, theoretically, while you can make the agent go any direction at continuously defined, 
But just to keep things simple, we might say, okay, we only count per degree. So 32 degrees north of east or 33 degrees north of east. So in that sense, we might be able to discretize such a continuous environment. Okay, comes to the last one. Last but not the least, uh, the environment type is called known versus unknown. Now, we just studied a bunch of them today. Let's not confuse it with, with observable or unobservable. Rather, the environment may be observable and may still be unknown. So what is referred by an unknown environment is when we do not quite know, what do the actuators actually do? So in other sense, the rules of the physics in this environment are not well known. Normally, one would think that if you press on the, on the brake pedal, the car will slow down or stop. But perhaps we do not know which one is the gas pedal and which one is the brake pedal. So we do not know what is the particular, how does this environment behave? So in that sense, this environment is unknown. The rules of physics of this environment are unknown. Okay. So those are the seven different environment types. Fairly easy to understand. Uh, if we go back one more time here, let's go through them very quickly here, just on this slide. The environment may be fully observable or partially observable, may have the number of agents as one or many, which themselves might have different kind of working relationship with each other, competitive or collaborative, or some partially competitive, par some partially collaborative. The environment may be deterministic or probabilistic. It could have, it could be the environment might be episodic or sequential. The environment could be static or dynamic. Again, uh, the static and dynamic refers to whether the environment has to be observed once or it has to be observed again and again before we make a decision. The environment could be discrete or continuous and the environment might be known or unknown in the sense whether its rules of physics are known or not known. And finally, before we wrap this, before this, we wrap this part of the lecture up, let's also quickly review what are the agent types. What we were studying so far here was what is the environment and how does the agent and the task environment interaction, how do we encapsulate that? The piece, uh, the performance measures, the environment or the task environment, the actuators and the sensors. Finally, let's talk about the agent types as well. There are four commonly known agent types, each in their order of, uh, of complexity, as well as speed, which kind of goes down a little bit as we go forward. And this is really what the rest of the lecture series is all about. They're simple reflex agents, which simply take a look at the current observation. They have some predefined rules and simply do that action. So those are the simplest agents, often the fastest agents. Often some of the most common agents that you see on the market already, they are reflex agents. For example, some kind of vacuum cleaners, et cetera. They have a specific thing they already do. Now, even the vacuum, vacuum cleaner agents are rapidly growing in their, uh, in their complexity, but the simplest sensor-based agent could be called a simple reflex agent. Similarly, there are model-based agents which have an internal model, simply interpret the environment based on the model, they do a specific action. Goal-based agent, which are simply trying to achieve the goal, and the utility-based based agents, which use the concept of utility, not just a goal, which essentially they try to measure the utility and choose the action on the basis of that utility. Mostly, we are interested in all of these agent types, but primarily the last one for the purpose of this lecture series. And our interest will mostly be on how to make such an agent fast as well as have the highest possible utility which is why we study the rest of this class here um, that's pretty much what we have for today keep learning and see you in the rest of the lecture series